Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our evening worship service. And uh, let me share with you just a couple of announcements. Ladies, if you are signed up for the women's retreat, that does occur this coming weekend, Friday evening and Saturday. And if you are interested in carpooling, please contact the church office for that. Also, ladies, you have a night out at Zeppi's Restaurant coming up here at the end of the month. So uh, that's, I love Zeppi's. Uh, I wondered if I wore my kilt, if I could go, maybe, maybe I could sneak in. Uh, but it uh, sounds like a wonderful time, so uh, there's a sign-up list uh, for that in the narthex. Do remember the Salinas family, they're going to be moving this week. It'll be at the latter part of the week. They'll be coming into town and hopefully be with us here uh, next Lord's Day. Also, next Lord's Day evening, we have a special missions presentation in the evening. We have uh, one of our missionaries who's working in a secured area. Um, we just used the initials B and P for this husband and wife team. Uh, they will be here, well, he will be here, she will not uh, get to be with him. And so a reminder for those who may be watching this on FaceTime uh, or who see it later that that evening service will not be broadcast uh, due to the sensitive nature of his ministry. So that will not be broadcast. If you want to know about it, uh, then you will need to, to be here and a part of the service. Those are the announcements that I have for you this evening. Let's take our worship folders and turn to our evening order of service. And I'm going to ask you to stand for our call to worship that comes to us this evening from Psalm 138. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. Let's take our hymnals, please. The hymn is 103. 103, Holy God, we praise your name.
gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have given us this day, the Lord's Day, a day of rest, a Sabbath day, to worship you and to gather with your people. As we come to the conclusion of this day, O oh Lord, we long to end this day in your presence, rejoicing in your name, singing your praise. And so we ask, O oh Lord, that you will come and inhabit the praises of your people. Come, O oh Lord, and fill this place that we might know you are with us, that we might know that we have met with you, our God. We pray that you will encourage us tonight through your word, that you will instruct us in your truth, that we might walk in the paths of righteousness for your name's sake. Amen. Next, we're going to sing hymn number 59, please. 59, Forever Settled in the Heaven. Metrical version of one of the stanzas of Psalm 119. At this time, I'm going to ask the ushers, please, to come for our evening offering. As we go to prayer this evening, let me ask if there are any prayer requests you would like to add to those that we have in the bulletin. Do we have anything? May I mention Walt? Um, yeah, I'd like to mention the, the Miller's brother-in-law, um, Walt, who has terminal cancer. 
Oswald and his wife, Nancy, served as missionaries. Where, what country were they in? Congo. In the Congo, that's right. Congo, Zaire, uh, Presbyterian missionaries there for many years. And uh, Walt's uh, now on hospice care, I'm sure. And uh, uh, thankfully can be at home. So if you would uh, pray for them, Tim and Rhonda go down to minister to them and be with them as much as they can. So uh, let's remember Walt and Nancy tonight. Anything else you'd like to add? All right, let's pray together. Our kind and loving Heavenly Father, every day that you give us is a gift of your grace. Every day you care for us and shower your good benefits on us. And we thank you, Lord, for the blessings that come from heaven above. As we were studying your word last week, we know that every good and every perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow due to change. We thank you, Lord, that from everlasting to everlasting, you are God, that you are utterly reliable and faithful, that you never change and therefore your word remains true and we can stand upon it. And Father, we thank you for the gift of your word. That you have given us holy scripture. That we can have it in our own language. That we can have it even in multiple translations. To give us insight and understanding into the nuances of the words. Father, we thank you for the ministry of Bible translation that goes on around the world. For the missionaries that have given their lives to studying linguistics and to studying people groups and being able to translate your word into their native languages. And we pray that you would bless the work of Bible translation. We pray for those who serve you in that way with Wycliffe Bible translators. And uh, we thank Lord of the, the seed company uh, working with Wycliffe to raise up translations of scripture that are faithful and that can be used to spread the gospel. And here we are, Lord, with your word in our own tongue and how grateful we are for it, for the rich heritage that we have in our English Bibles. And we pray, O oh Lord, that every day we might avail ourselves of reading your word, of memorizing it, of hiding it in our hearts, that we might not sin against you. Thank you for the good gift of the Holy Bible. Thank you for the good gifts, Lord, that you give to us daily, providing for us food and clothing and shelter and help. But we, not, we know that all do not enjoy those gifts equally and alike. And we pray tonight for those who are going through difficulties, through ill health, through disease, in recovering from surgery. Father, we especially want to pray tonight for the Millers, for their sister and brother-in-law, for Walt and Nancy. And Father, we thank you for this faithful couple, for their love for you. We thank you that Walt faces death with the hope and assurance of the gospel and that the only sadness is the sadness of parting with those whom he dearly loves on earth. And we pray, Father, that you will come and minister to Walt and Nancy in very real and special ways during this time to Tim and Rhonda as well, and to the extended family. Father, we thank you for the hope that the gospel offers us. That this life is not all there is. If we had hope only in this life, we would indeed be of all people most miserable. But we thank you for the hope of life to come and the hope of the resurrection. Lord, we ask for those who are suffering tonight from recovery with surgery. We pray for our brother Adam Crea also for Ren Shardle. We would ask you, Lord, for those who have gone through injuries like Bruce Blakely, that you would heal him. And uh, for Zach Zwiebel, the Chris grandson who's been suffering from a pulmonary embolism. Father, tonight we would pray for Sean Svaka as he also continues to heal from surgery. Thank you that he could be here to worship with us today. Continue to 
to strengthen our brother and to encourage him as he strives to walk with you in difficult circumstances. Lord, we also want to pray for the ministries of this church. We thank you for our person of the week, Frida Whaley. We pray not only for her, but Lord, for those who are involved in our hospitality committee. And for the outreach, Lord, that we're involved in with RUF at the University of Akron and for the upcoming transition to Kent State. We pray for Nate and Naomi Bauer. And Lord, you have called them to serve college students. And we pray that you will bless that ministry with conversions, with discipleship, and with growth. Remember our sister congregation, Harvest Presbyterian in Medina, and their search for a new pastor, as well as Covenant Theological Seminary and its new president, Dr. Gibbs. Lord, we face so many pressures today in the world, in the church, to compromise, to bend to the culture, to change the standards of your truth so that we might present ourselves as more acceptable to those who are not willing to bend to your truth. We pray, Lord, that you will give Dr. Gibbs the, the courage of deep conviction to lead the seminary in faithfulness. We pray, O oh Lord, you'll protect our seminary, that it will indeed be a seminary, a seedbed for raising up men for pastoral ministry, for raising up missionaries to serve you around the world, for raising up counselors who will take your word and apply it to the hearts of those who are hurting. Lord, we pray that the seminary will flourish, that you will raise up more professors like the late Dr. David Calhoun, how we praise you for the blessed memory of this godly servant. Men like Dr. Robert Raymond, Rayburn and, and also Dr. Robert Raymond, who loved you and were so faithful in teaching your truth. Continue, Lord, to raise up servants, to minister the gospel and the teaching of the various fields that are necessary for training gospel workers. Father, remember us as a congregation, and we pray especially tonight for the Salinas family as they prepare to move this week. Please help them through all of the difficult steps involved in this transition. We pray that Justin and Nikki and the girls will come to us in the blessing and power of the Spirit, and that you will use their ministry here, especially, Lord, in reaching out to young families in our community and working with our college and career, that you will grow and disciple the young people of our church through their ministry, that you will grow Justin as a minister of the gospel, that through it you will get great glory to your name. We pray for us as a congregation that we will remain true to the scriptures and obedient to the great commission that you have given us to spread the gospel, we might be faithful to all that you say, that we might maintain our confessional commitments to be orthodox and reformed, that, Lord, we will be not only standing firm in the faith, but flourishing through the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray that we might experience the Spirit's power here tonight as we open up the Word of God together and seek to study its truth. Lead and guide us, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Before we turn to the scriptures, let me ask you to take your worship folder one more time. And you'll see a hymn that's printed there. Uh, I think it may be new to us. Uh, I think it's new to me, at least. I'm going to ask, uh, Jen, would you play through this once so we could hear the tune? And then no, we'll... Brethren Whip. Oh, it's the Brethren Whip. Oh, well, I'll we know yeah, play it through, we'll follow the words, then we'll stand to sing.
stand together. I looked at the tune name, I would have known that, Holy Manor. Yeah, very good. Well, that is a, a well-known tune. I think of that as a camp meeting tune. Uh, but those are new words, uh, for me at least. Uh, but what a, what a wonderful prayer. I would encourage you, uh, cut that page out of your bulletin and tuck that in your Bible. That would be a great hymn to just pray through, or you know the tune, sing through uh, in your devotions. Uh, what a wonderful list of requests to ask of God uh, as we come to his word. Well, we are turning to James this evening as we continue our studies in this letter. And this evening we're going to begin our reading at verse 19. I'm going to read down to the end of the chapter so that we get the larger context here. And our study this evening is going to focus on verses 19 through 21, 19 through 21. But let's read together, beginning in verse 19. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself, and goes away, and at once forgets what he is like. The one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. This is God's holy and living word. Let's pray. Father, you have told us that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from your mouth. This is the living bread that we need. The word that teaches us of Jesus and of your grace and of your love. 
This is the word we need tonight, O oh Lord, because we need your wisdom. We need to be taught by you and instructed in your ways so that we might know you. And so come to that end tonight. Be our teacher. Be our guide. And may all that we say be for your glory. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I want to ask you this evening, what are you doing with God's word? What can you do with God's word? What should you do with God's word? From a negative standpoint, you can reject it. You can deny it. You can hate it. You can mock it. And sometimes people even burn it. This is the world's reaction to express their hatred for God and for his truth. From a positive standpoint, of course, you can read it, receive it, love it, believe it, memorize it, pray it, sing it, teach it, preach it, brother. This is the duty and the privilege that we have as the church of Jesus Christ. The duty and, and the privilege of the believing heart. Scripture should be, of course, a, a regular part of our daily routine, a part of our daily diet, if you will. Uh, as a church, we, we try to make the scriptures such a prominent part of our service that you're hearing the Bible from beginning to end, from the call to worship to the benediction, uh, the bidding to repentance, the assurance of pardon, readings from the Old Testament, readings from the New, even lengthy readings like this morning. We don't apologize for that because our goal is scripture saturation. It was said of John Bunyan that no matter where you pricked him, he would bleed the Bible. Uh, we, we want to be like a, a sponge that's so saturated with the word of God that, that the slightest pressure on us, uh, we, we just simply pour out the word of God then in times of distress. What do we do with the Word of God when we go through trials and times of stress? Well, too often we ignore it. It's sad to say, but when we're under pressure, often the Bible is the first thing that gets pushed to the side. What should we do with the Word of God during our times of stress and hardship? Well, that's the question that James addresses in our passage this evening. This evening I want us to begin to look at the, the latter half of James chapter 1 and the scriptures in the hands of sufferers. And what we're going to see is that amid our trials, you and I have a responsibility before God to accept and to practice his word. We are to receive the word. We are to do the word if in the middle of our sufferings we are to expect to experience its blessings and its benefits. From verse 19 down through the end of the chapter where we read this evening, the apostle lays out for us two main admonitions, two commands that really capture this message. And I want us to focus on the first one of these this evening. And that is in verses 19 through 21, we are to receive, receive the implanted word. Now verses 19 through 21, and especially verse 21, picks up on the theme of God's word that we last saw in verse 18. If you look back there, it reads, Of his own will, that is of God's own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. God used 
his word, specifically here it's called the word of truth, the gospel, his message of Jesus Christ, to work in our hearts, to be his instrument that he might regenerate us, give us new life, and bring us to repentance and faith. Uh, this is closely aligned with what the Apostle Paul says in Romans 10, 17. So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The father of lights who's created the heavenly lights is our father. He's created new life in us and he has used his gospel word to do that. Now, a reference to the word also occurs in verse 21, when James writes, Therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness, here he calls it, the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. Now, it appears on first reading that James has played leapfrog with verses 19 and 20. Some commentators even go so far as to say as much. They note how difficult this letter is to outline, and I can attest uh, from firsthand experience that it's quite a challenge because James seems to move from one topic to the other rather quickly. But this letter is not thrown together haphazardly. He's talked about the truth of the gospel, or God's word of truth in verse 18. He does insert what appear to be just some simple, unrelated maxims of wisdom in verses 19 through 20, and then reverts back to the topic of the word of truth, the implanted word, in verse 21. But as we examine these three verses this evening, I want us to see that while they contain these general axioms of wisdom, they are an integral part of James's pastoral counsel about the use of the word of God in the believer's life. James lays out for us here three principles of wisdom that have a special bearing on his scattered and suffering congregation, as well as a specific application with respect to the scriptures. So as, as we look at these verses, especially verses 19 and 20, I want us to think of working in concentric circles. Uh, we're going to start at the perimeter, the large outer ring, and we're going to look at these principles in light of God's word as a whole. But then we're going to move in closer. Uh, we're going to spiral in to, to look at these verses in the context in which James is writing. And then we're going to narrow in to this specific context of verse 18 and follow. So what are these three principles? First, James instructs his readers to be quick to hear. Quick to hear. Now, we often classify this letter as a part of the New Testament's wisdom literature because it has such a close affinity with what we find in Old Testament wisdom literature, especially the writings of Solomon and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. James says here, be quick to hear. Now listen to Solomon in Ecclesiastes 5, verses 1 and 2. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God to draw near to listen is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools. Now think just for a moment about the contrast he's drawing here. Draw near to listen. Now if that's the opposite of the sacrifice of fools, what's the sacrifice of fools? Talking too much. Be quick to hear. Slow to speak. It's better to draw near to listen than to offer the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know that they're doing evil. Be not rash with your mouth, Solomon writes, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. When you're quick to hear, you are eager to listen to other people. You're, you're eager to receive counsel and advice. A, a person who's quick to hear is therefore humble, open to what others have to say. 
Uh, he or she is a know-it-all who has nothing to learn from anyone because the wisest people know how much wisdom they lack. The wisest people know that they need to grow and they're willing to grow and learn from others. In other words, they have a teachable spirit. Have you ever met someone and they just exude this attitude of, my mind is made up, don't confuse me with the facts. Right? That kind of person is not quick to hear. I was in a meeting this past week in which the participants had to discuss a controversial topic. We all had questions about it. We all had concerns. We all had opinions. And one particular person in this meeting expressed his concern over the issue at hand. And then he said this, if someone has a biblical argument to make, then I'm willing to listen. There's a wise man who is quick to hear. The counterpart to this counsel is the second principle here. Be slow to speak. Now Solomon has a lot to say about this topic as well. If you've read through Proverbs, listen to these words from Proverbs 10, 19. When words are many, transgression is not lacking. But whoever restrains his lips is prudent. Or in the next chapter, Proverbs 11, verses 12 and 13, whoever restrains his words has knowledge, and he who has a cool spirit is a man of understanding. Even a fool who keeps silent is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he is deemed intelligent. You've probably heard the popularized version of this wisdom. It's been attributed to Abraham Lincoln, uh, to Mark Twain, although probably neither of them actually said it. Better to remain silent and be thought a fool than to speak and remove all doubt. Slow to speak. And then slow to anger. Proverbs 14, 29, whoever is slow to anger has great understanding. But he who has a hasty temper exalts folly. Or again, the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 9. Be not quick in your spirit to become angry. For anger lodges in the heart of fools. Now, when we look at these three maxims, we, we can see how integrated they are. If you're quick to listen, then you're going to be slow to speak. Because it's difficult to listen and to speak at the same time. But we've also seen that hasty speech and a failure to listen can easily lead to anger. And isn't it true that anger most often comes to expression, at least first of all, in our speech, what we have to say? Now you'll notice here that James demands that we follow these admonitions. He's used the imperative mood. He's in command mode here. We have a responsibility before God and before others to be slow or quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. But the demand is ultimately for us to have a spirit-controlled temperament. You and I are incapable of exercising this kind of wisdom in our own power. It just doesn't lie within us. We need, therefore, the wisdom that James is going to describe in chapter 3 as wisdom that comes from above. Remember last week we, we saw that every good and every perfect gift comes down from above? One of those good and perfect gifts is this wisdom that he describes like this. Pure, 
peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. Because you see, the wisdom from above is quick to hear and slow to speak and slow to anger. Because the anger that you and I experience and express, the anger of man is incapable of bringing to expression the righteous acts of God that he requires. I know almost nothing about dancing except this. I, I have three left feet. That much I know. I do know, however, that the steps of the foxtrot are supposed to be slow, slow, quick, quick. Slow, slow, quick, quick. And if you're interested in seeing that in action, don't look at me. Watch an old Fred Astaire or Ginger Rogers movie. But if the foxtrot is slow, slow, quick, quick, then the wisdom waltz is quick, slow. Now, let's look at these three maxims of wisdom as, as they work out in the context specifically here of James and his scattered and suffering congregation. Why are these admonitions specifically needed by believers who are going through hardship and trials? Because impatience and anger are often our first reaction when you and I are put under pressure. And so we are to be quick to hear. Now this admonition works in two ways. First, we need to be quick to hear when we ourselves are suffering. When we're going through trials, we're usually not very good listeners. Uh, we're often unwilling to take counsel from other people because we believe no one really understands what we're going through, what we're facing. And often we discover many people have been through much worse. But we also need to be quick to hear when someone else is suffering and needs us to listen. James calls for us to be patient, ready to hear the other, humble, concerned, genuinely concerned with what the other person has to say. Have you ever had a conversation when the person keeps looking at their watch? I, I'm ashamed to say that I, I've been guilty of that. You know, you're under the pressure of the moment. You've got an appointment you've got to run to. Uh, your mind is going through your to-do list. But in those moments when I keep... Wonder, maybe, maybe I shouldn't do that because then you'll start looking at your watch. <laughs> Be quick to hear. <laughs> in those moments, I demonstrate a greater eagerness about myself and what I have to do than a genuine interest in the other person. Being quick to hear means we are willing to invest the time and the mental and emotional energy that it involves to really listen. When I've taught at various seminaries, I stress with students that one of the greatest pastoral skills in the world is listening. And that when they go into pastoral ministry, they will find that a great deal of their time will be spent listening. But that's not just true of we professional clergy. It should be true of every believer who's genuinely concerned about their brother and sister. It's one of the greatest gifts you can give to someone. Is to actually hear what they have to say. Because when a person is going through suffering, that's one of the greatest things they need. Someone will hear we need to be quick to listen to others. 
so that we can then give counsel when the time comes, when the appropriate time comes, so we are slow to speak. And this command also has a twofold application. First, with regard to your own suffering, don't be rash in your response to your trials. Don't automatically assume that you know the reason you're suffering, the reason you're facing some particular hardship. You may or you may not be right. But second, with regard to the trials and hardships of others, don't automatically assume that you know the reason they're suffering as well. A person slow to speak is patient with others. Doesn't jump the gun, doesn't automatically assume that he or she has the answers. He's slow to speak because he's quick to listen. I well remember a pastoral situation I was in many, many years ago. Uh, you, none of you know any of the people involved. This was another galaxy far, far away. But I was sitting with another pastor, and, and he was really the lead in this counseling situation. And I watched a man who, who was under a lot of stress, a man who was very frustrated with his circumstances in life, and he started to just pour his heart out. And, you know, I was sort of the third party in the room, and I could watch the dynamic as it unfolded. This guy's pouring his heart out. The other minister isn't really getting what the guy's saying but is automatically rattling off sort of spiritual platitudes as counsel. And I'm watching the guy's face and the expressions on his face were saying, you don't get it. You don't have a clue what I'm saying. It, there was puzzlement. There was pain on his face. The counsel that he was receiving came across as shallow at best and as completely inappropriate at worst. I wasn't the lead pastor in that situation. Uh, I couldn't say very much. But, but I just remember that look of bewilderment on the man's face that said, you really aren't hearing me. Now, I'm not going to pretend for a moment that I would have done better in that counseling situation. Uh, I, I know I would not have. I, I was green in the ministry and I knew even less than I know now, and that's terrifying. But the lesson of that moment was not lost on me. The man was not really hurt, and therefore the quick response did not meet the need. We must be willing to close our mouths and listen try to really listen before we offer any kind of response. In our suffering, we're to be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Have you ever thought, spoken, or acted out of anger under the pressure of the moment, under your trial? Why do we get angry when we suffer? Well, suffering disrupts our plans. You see, I, I've got everything planned out. I know exactly how life should go. I know what my schedule should be for tomorrow. And when something disrupts that, I don't like it. Not a little bit. I don't like it at all. Suffering disrupts what we want to do. James is going to directly address the underlying cause of this in chapter 4. I'll mention it now. We'll dig into it further at that time. But he writes there in verses 1 and 2, What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder, you covet, and cannot obtain. So you fight and quarrel, you do not have, because you do not ask. You see, suffering and the disruption of our plans touches our desires. You start touching my desires. You start messing with what I want. And I get upset. 
we react to suffering with anger because suffering sometimes deprives us of our dreams. The way we envisioned life, what we wanted out of life, we realize at times we will never attain and we get upset. We respond to suffering with anger because we assume we deserve better. Hey, don't you get what a nice guy I am? Huh? Why should I have to face this or that? Retorts and anger are often our first responses to suffering. When our first response ought to be to listen up, to button up, and to calm down. Listen up, button up, and calm down. Dance the waltz of wisdom. Quick, slow, slow. Now, we've looked at these admonitions in the broad context of the Bible, the wisdom literature of the Old Testament. And in the more general context of James writing to his suffering congregation. But let's look now at these admonitions in their immediate context of verses 18 and 21. You see, James sandwiches these three commands between references to Scripture, and that isn't by mistake. Uh, this is... James, the brother of Jesus, not James Joyce. You see, James Joyce, the Irish author, uh, was known for his stream of consciousness. Uh, my, my nephew, my nephew is a professor. Uh, he did his PhD on James Joyce. He reads it, he likes it, he even understands it. And that makes, that puts him on a whole different level than, than I'm on. This stream of consciousness, we, you know, where your inner thoughts just take you wherever they lead you. That's not James. It's James Joyce. <laughs> Nothing about the Bible is random. And so order and sequence here are important because I hope you get this, that order and sequence are a vital part of context. And context is king when it comes to interpretation. So what does it mean then? To be quick to hear. Well, if God brings us to new life through the word of truth, and as we're going to see in a moment, we're to receive this implanted word with meekness. To be quick to hear means that we must be eager, brothers and sisters, to drink in, to, to take in, to listen to and receive the word of God as much as we can. One commentator put it this way. It is an urgent task to be quick to listen. And where Christians are thus engaged, they will be slow to speak. They must listen carefully and patiently to God before they presume to act or speak in his name. Are you quick to hear the word of God? Or do you find excuses? Well, I know you're quick to hear you're here tonight. You're doing one of the most unusual things, even in American church culture, and that's coming the second time on Sunday to hear the word. That's strange today. I, I don't know if you get that. It used to be a regular part of uh, the Christian's life, but, it, but it's an odd thing to have two services now. But this is a way you and I can be quick to hear, eager to receive God's word. But then only as we hear God's word, and really understand it, can we then speak? So we should be slow to speak. We should only speak when we actually know what the Bible says. So when we're dealing with someone, when we're counseling someone, we need to accurately reflect what the scriptures are saying and not just our own ideas. I once attended a memorial service. 
uh, in which people were allowed to stand up and, and say a few words about the deceased. It was an unusual set of circumstances, and uh, I was the only minister there. I was the only pastor or clergyman, and I had known the man. I'd shared the gospel with him, and I thought I need to, to stand and, and, and say a few things because the room was pretty much filled with Jehovah's Witnesses. And I thought, I, I can't sit here and be silent. I, I've got, I have to be a witness. <laughs> I need to stand up and, and say something. So I spoke only for just a, a few moments, but uh, afterwards another man stood up, and I'm sure my wife will well remember this story. Uh, the gentleman began, well, like the reverend was saying in the Bible, it says if you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day, but if you teach a man to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. And, uh, you know, it's hard in those situations not to just sort of start laughing. Uh, the guy was serious. Uh, he wasn't slow to speak. Uh, he was claiming uh, the authority of Scripture when he had none. Uh, Maybe may a nice moral, uh, but nothing more. When we're quick to hear the Word of God, it will put a restraint on our speech because we're going to want our words to reflect his truth. Set a guard over my lips, the psalmist prays, and therefore slow to anger. When you're quick to hear the word of God, then you're willing to let God be the judge. We don't let everything anger us, but when we do react with any kind of fury or wrath, we let scripture guide us so that we're angry about the things God's angry about. And then we have righteous indignation. Now, from these general admonitions, these maxims, these axioms of wisdom, James draws a specific implication. I want us to take just, just a couple of minutes here to look at it in verse 21. Therefore, therefore. Now this is a connecting word to draw a logical inference. And, and those commentators who think that James is a bit haphazard here, they, they would take this therefore and link it back to verse 18. We've been born again by, by the truth of the gospel. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness. But I don't think that's the right way to read this. I believe the, the implications here are being drawn from verses 19 and 20. If you and I are going to act with godly wisdom, if we're going to dance this waltz of wisdom, quick, slow, slow, then that's going to depend upon how you and I respond to God's word in our hearts. We are to put away, therefore, all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Now, James and Paul are often pitted against each other, right? Especially on the doctrine of justification. But... James' instructions here, to me, sound very Pauline. He uses the imagery of putting off and putting on. Taking off the old dirty clothes, putting on clean clothes, rooting out old sins, and receiving the implanted word. He begins with the removal, putting off the garments of sin, in other words, you and I are to put away anything in our lives that's hindering our reception of the Word of God. What is it that's keeping you from being quick to hear? Get rid of it. Because it's only hindering your spiritual growth and your usefulness in the kingdom. So he says, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness. Now, the word filthiness can refer quite literally to dirty clothes. But it's used figuratively here for moral filth. Anything that's contrary to the law of God that defiles the soul and makes us unclean in his sight. 
And then we're to put away what the ESV translates as rampant wickedness. I love the King James here. The superfluity of naughtiness. Don't you love that? The superfluity of naughtiness. Naughtiness, kakia in the Greek, is wickedness. Anything that's contrary to God, anything that's sinful, that's a transgression. And then you have this word superfluity, this abundance, this rampantness. If, if I say to you, the weeds are rampant in my yard, what do I mean? I mean they're everywhere, right? Something that's rampant has taken over. It's taken control. And James says you're to get rid of anything and everything in your life that would be wicked that dares to try to take control of you. Rid it from your lives. We all struggle with temptation and sin, but we must not be brought under the, dom the domination of any sin so that it's out of control. We put away our sin by living in that regular experience of conversion. As we repent and believe the gospel with newfound faith every day. But not only are we to put off all of this moral uncleanness and this superfluity of naughtiness. Rampant wickedness. But we are to put on. We are to receive what he calls here the implanted word. What is the implanted word? It's the gospel. It's the word of God's grace that he plants in your heart when he gives you new life. It's the message of the new covenant. James here is reflecting what Jeremiah writes in Jeremiah 31, 33. The Lord says, this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law where? Within them. It will be implanted in them. I'll write it on their hearts and I'll be their God and they will be my people. It's the word that Jesus taught about in Mark 4, the parable of the sword. The sower goes out to scatter the seed, and the seed is the word of God. And some of that seed falls by the wayside, and the birds come and devour it. And some of it falls on rocky ground, and it doesn't have that depth of soil. So it can't get good, strong roots, and when the sun comes out, it scorches it and it dies. Ah, but then, then there's that implanted seed of that seed that goes down into the heart takes deep root, it sprouts, grows, it blooms, and it bears fruit. Yes, everyone's different. We're all in different places in our Christian lives, so some 30-fold, some 60-fold, some 100-fold. But when God does this miraculous work of regeneration that he talks about in Jeremiah 31, when the word of God is planted in you, when by the word of truth he brings you to new life, there will be a harvest. There will be fruit. Because you will become, as the latter part of this chapter says, a doer of the word and not a hearer only. How are you to receive this implanted word? With humility. Be quick to hear. And what will it do for you? It will save your soul. We tend to think of salvation in, in simply one dimension. When we got saved in the past. And you, may, you may have the date written in the front of your Bible. You may not know the date. It may be hard for you to pinpoint a, a specific time on the calendar. But we refer to a, a conversion experience, if you will. But in the Bible, salvation is much more comprehensive. Yes, it's true. We can talk about when we got saved, when we came to Christ, when we came to faith. Wonderful. But brothers and sisters, do you realize we're also being saved right now? 
We're being delivered from, from that power of sin that remains within us as God continually works on us to sanctify us. But then one day we will be saved, delivered from the very presence of sin. And it will be this gospel word, this implanted word, that does How might we this evening take what James has taught us and turn it into a prayer? Let me suggest that this is at least one way to do it. And with this, we close. Gracious Lord, let not my heart lie fallow, but plow it by the gentle grace of the Holy Spirit. Sow the seed of your gospel truth upon it. Water it with your mercy. Cause that seed to take deep root and bear abundant fruit. So that I may dance the waltz of wisdom. And be quick to hear. Slow to speak. And slow to anger. Amen. Will you please take your hymn books this evening and turn to our closing hymn, 672. 672. And let's stand as we sing, Trust and Obey.
And now may grace, mercy, and peace be with all of you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And I was like,